Hello everybody and welcome to the next episode of The Dry Dock. As with the last one, we have a couple of little housekeeping issues to go over. One of which is the Q&A structure for The Dry Dock is going to be changing very slightly. Um, and that's basically because I took a look at the ever-growing list and it, it basically comes down to the fact that between Discord questions, questions on YouTube, etc., the number of questions is growing at a rate faster than I can answer them. So I need to uh, slightly change the way the dry dock works. Now this, it doesn't mean anyone's going to not be answered. And I mean, cutting down, uh, going through the list, there will be, will be a cut down of the size of the list because obviously some questions will have been asked before and I can just direct people to those answers. Um, however, currently, not including the Discord questions, my... Q&A text document has 36 pages and uh, that basically means I'm running about um, between four and six weeks behind. So in order to make sure that people are actually getting their questions answered <coughs> as best I can, what I'm going to be doing in the future is sticking all these questions into a spreadsheet and then basically doing an RNG um, and pulling questions at random from the overall list rather than what we've been doing so far which is uh, basically answering them in the order that they've come in so uh, that, that that's the one change hopefully everyone will understand why it means that if you do ask a question you've got a reasonable chance of it being answered in in semi-decent time um, and i will obviously keep an eye on questions that have maybe ticked over for far too long and just pull those up to answer straight away okay so there's that Secondly is uh, the Robo Voice videos. People have uh, obviously people comment on them all the time, uh, both in favour and against. So for those of you who like them, they're not going anywhere. For those of you who don't like them and prefer to listen to my voice, which appears to be the majority, be assured that there are firm plans to revoice all of them, and those sort of packages of revoiced videos will be released alongside the Wednesday specials. Um, over the next few months hopefully maybe maybe it might take a bit longer than that but in either case um, you will get the full channel content in human voice eventually so don't worry there and finally um, is just a quick note on collaboration videos so I've been doing a number of collaborative videos with Napalm Ratta and uh, so there is now a collaboration playlist in uh, the channel and if that's if you want to go and have a bit more of a listen to those uh, feel free to do so obviously um some of them have five minute guides to the ship that's under discussion and there are two where we just basically talk for about an hour about uh, various bits of naval technology um just so again for assurance purposes uh, if i've promised to do a five minute guide on this channel and there's a the ship is covered on Napalm Ratter's channel, that doesn't mean I'm not doing a five minute guide on this channel, it just means that you've got an opportunity to listen to uh, sort of the, the my first version of that five minute guide over there, whereas over here, um, <laughs> yeah, looking over at the number of ships I've got to review, it might be a while for some of those ships to actually come up on this channel. So there you go, collaboration videos, have a look if you like, um, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. So with that, all said and done, it is time to switch over to the questions for this week um, using the first of our RNG generated list. So the first question, which I think can basically be said to come from almost everybody, is why was the Japanese 25mm AA so bad? Um, loads of people have asked this because I've made a lot of snarky comments about it in a number of videos, so let's look into that. So the mimetically bad Japanese AA gun actually started life in France, of all places. Basically because in the run-up to World War II, as tensions in Europe increased, the French had a look at their anti-aircraft capacity, uh, specifically their mobile light anti-aircraft capacity, and realised it basically amounted to... Now go away or I 
I shall taunt you a second time. So, having decided they needed something slightly more than harsh language, the French government held a competition, and the Hotchkiss Company submitted a design for a 25mm anti-aircraft gun. The French government rejected this gun in favour of a Schneider 37mm autocannon. One of the primary reasons for rejecting it was that its rate of fire was too slow. So, having already been rejected by the French, the Hotchkiss company turned around and sold them to the Romanians. At which point it turned out Schneider weren't actually ready to produce the 37mm, and the French basically seized all of the 25mm that were about to be exported to Romania as a sort of last-ditch light-to-medium anti-aircraft defence measure, which meant that with a few hundred of those and a couple hundred 20mm Orlikans, that was the sum total of French light and medium anti-aircraft at fire in the start of the Second World War, which, as you can imagine, didn't really impress the Luftwaffe very much. But what it did mean was that Japan bought a license to manufacture the weapon, and they called it the Type 96 25mm anti-aircraft and occasional anti-tank gun. Ironically enough, this weapon was bought to replace earlier Vickers 40mm pom-pom guns um, that would still feature on British warships in the start of the Second World War in Octuple Mounts. As it would turn out, this was probably a mistake, because I have a distinct feeling that although the 40mm Vickers pom-pom was not exactly the world's best anti-aircraft weapon, it probably would have done a hell of a lot better job than these things. So the first thing they did upon getting production fully set up in Japan was they started making changes. And anyone in who's listening to this who has either served in the military or is currently serving in the military can probably start screaming now because that famous phrase, we changed the design to make it simpler, came up. Specifically, some of the forged components were replaced with cast components because these could be made easier and they also changed the flash suppressor. Eventually, the gun would be offered in double, triple, and single mount varieties. And when based on ships, you could have either a powered or an unpowered version of the mount. And this is where the major problems started cropping up. First of all, ship-based mounts used the Type 95 sight. However, the Type 95 sight was not capable of tracking aircraft moving at the kind of speeds that you would find in World War II. So they had to retrofit an additional sighting ring onto the sighting telescope. Next was the fact that if you had overheated the barrel, or damaged it, or worn it out, or for any other reason, like, say, being under constant attack, needed to change one of the barrels, this operation was going to take you at least five minutes, two men, and require a whole bunch of specialist tools. So, effectively, if anything went wrong with one of your gun barrels, that gun was practically out of the fight for the duration of the attack. Next was the fact that all of the mountings, regardless of whether they were single, twin, or triple, trained very slowly and elevated very slowly. Um, ridiculously so, in fact, and even in powered mounts, um, it was still quite the slow gun. Now, obviously, when you're under attack by very fast aircraft that have a vested interest in moving as quickly as possible to execute their assault and get away, having your mass fire lighter medium caliber anti-aircraft gun and not being able to track them is not exactly helpful. So even with the uh, retrofitted increased... Uh, optical rings on the sights. The simple fact of the matter was that half the time these guns found it very difficult, if not impossible, to actually track the aircraft they were shooting at. And thanks to those so-called simplified cast instead of forged fittings and components, the entire gun suffered from excessive vibration, and that was just the single mount. So on the triple mount, firing it was more like say, putting the entire crew in a miniature earthquake simulator and expecting this to somehow have a beneficial effect on accuracy. The new flash suppressor was also pretty terrible, and large muzzle flash was reported, which obviously obscures and blinds the gunners who are trying to see where they're shooting. So, to summarise some of these issues, if you're a Japanese gunner unlucky enough to be assigned to one of these things and under air attack by the American Navy, you probably couldn't point your gun accurately at the aircraft in the first place because your mount would turn too slowly. If you somehow managed to do that, your gun sight would only just about be able to show you where you needed to shoot. 
And then when you shot, you would be shooting more like, so please stop. And desperately holding on to something solid in an effort to stop yourself from being vibrated out of the gun cupola. And of course, to cap it all off, being a 25mm weapon, its shell wasn't very powerful, it didn't have that much range. And the final insult was that although its notional 220 round per minute rate of fire was quite good, unlike, say, the 40mm Bofors, which had an open box magazine on the top which you could just keep feeding shells into, this gun had a closed 15 round box magazine. And that meant you had about four seconds of continuous fire before, if you were using a naval triple mount, you'd have to stop and get people to reload every single one of the three 15-round magazines. So bearing in mind all those previous issues, if somehow you'd managed to get your gun in a position where you could fire on the enemy, your entire firing sequence would be something like this. Bang, 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 daka, 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 bang, 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 daka, daka, bang. Okay, men to the guns, take off the old magazine 1, put in new magazine 1, take off old magazine 2, put in new magazine 2, take off old magazine 3, put in new magazine 3, where the hell's the aircraft gone? Oh, it's over there. Turning, 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 still turning, 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 oh, there we are. Boom, 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 bang, bang, daka, daka, shoot, shoot, bang, explosion, bang. Repeat as necessary. So yeah, there's a hopefully brief insight into just why the Type 96 25mm gun was so terrible. So, going to the other end of the Dreadnought era, Mark Morgan, aka the Kosher Ham, says, Some suggest USS Michigan was the first Dreadnought. Any thoughts? So, USS Michigan was one of the two South Carolina-class dreadnoughts, and you might be thinking, well, obviously isn't the answer, it can't possibly have been because South Carolina was the lead ship of the class. Well, <laughs> yes it was, but in between the actual ordering and the laying down and complete completion, as with a number of other classes uh, that we've mentioned in the past few videos, Michigan was actually laid down a day earlier than South Carolina, launched almost two months earlier and commissioned almost three months earlier so Michigan was the lead ship of the class by most metrics except for the fact that South Carolina was officially ordered first so technically if you could argue that the class was the first dreadnoughts then you could argue that Michigan was in fact the first dreadnought now, there are two ways you could look at this in terms of trying to argue that the class was ahead of the Dreadnought, one of which is that the Dreadnought's designs were only completed in March 1905, when Congress passed a bill that authorised the South Carolina class in the same month of the same year. But the actual finalised designs weren't prepared until later, and HMS Dreadnought would actually start construction in 1905 and would be in service in 1906. She would actually start her trial voyages on the 3rd of October 1906, as compared to the South Carolina class, which at that point was still two to three months from being laid down. So in terms of overall design and construction, no, it cannot be argued that the South Carolinas and the USS Michigan specifically were the first Dreadnoughts, um, because Dreadnought was itself actually constructed and undergoing trials for service before either of the other two ships were even had their keels laid. The other aspect you could argue is what exactly makes a Dreadnought battleship. The Dreadnought had a number of advances compared to the South Carolina. It was larger, it was faster, it used turbine engines, um, it had tripod masts, albeit not in the best position, um, but they were still more successful than the lattice masts on the South Carolina class. Uh, but the one thing that the South Carolinas did a lot better than the Dreadnought was the main armament, because whilst Dreadnought's guns were laid out in an all-big gun arrangement, which is generally held to be the main definition of a Dreadnought battleship, the South Carolinas were actually the ones that introduced successful super-firing, which meant they got away with using four twin turrets instead of the Dreadnought's five twin turrets, but with both ships able to project exactly the same broadside of eight guns. So it basically comes down to, if you consider that the definition of a Dreadnought battleship is a battleship with an all-big gun armament and a secondary battery that is there purely to deal with torpedo boats and other things rather than as part of the main 
battle salvo, then the Dreadnought is undoubtedly the first. Whereas if you want to adopt a very specific definition of Dreadnought, which includes a requirement for super-firing main battery turrets, then yes, the South Carolinas would uh, be then the first Dreadnoughts. Um, and obviously USS Michigan being the first of the two would then become the first Dreadnought. However, I don't think that that is really an accurate definition because, well, Dreadnought, as defined at the time, was literally just all big gun. And secondly, there are a number of other Dreadnought battleships that were built going forward, specifically some of the Italian and Russian designs, where super-firing turrets weren't used, but they were very definitely Dreadnought battleships. Shannon Man 2 asks, when did the practice of paying prize money for capturing enemy ships stop? So as a brief recap for those of you not familiar, prize money basically started out as when a ship was captured in the Age of Sail, the ship and its cargo could then be sold, and part or all of the money resulting from that sale would then be distributed in a ranked system to the Admiral who had signed the ship's orders and the captain and crew of the ship involved in capturing it, or ships if there were more than one. So this obviously made a lot of people fairly rich and this explains why there are an awful lot of boarding actions in the Age of Sail. As for when it stopped, I'm so, so happy to be able to say it hasn't! <laughs> The circumstances under which a ship can receive prize money have been altered and reduced, much to the dismay, I'm sure, of many Royal Navy crewmen. Um, but prize money itself still exists as something that, if you're in the Royal Navy and you fulfil the right circumstances in capturing a certain type of ship, you can still claim. Um, the main changes, however, were that in the 20th century, uh, the Naval Prize Act was altered so that instead of the Age of Sail and Victorian era system where it would be paid primarily to the ship's crews that were involved directly in the capture, the money is now paid into a general fund where all serving naval personnel with more than six months service are awarded a fraction of the total value of the prize and that was then modified in the Second World War to allow Royal Air Force personnel um, who were involved in the capture of enemy ships to make claims as well. So yeah, if you uh, happen to be eligible for service in the Royal Navy and you think there's going to be a kind of war soon where you might be able to capture enemy shipping, you might get slightly richer for it. That's not an encouragement to start a war, all right? Sir Garland Tyrell, apparently on an interdimensional holiday, asks, Regarding British late war cruiser design, the trend seems to have been making them smaller and cheaper to produce. What was the reason for the sudden dramatic increase in the size of the planned Neptune class, given they would have had thinner armour than the towns? Uh, the heavier Mark 25 turrets doesn't seem to account for the equivalent of a Dido class cruiser added to displacement. Well, the Neptune's main belt armour was supposed to be as thick as the town classes at its maximum thickness. Another part of it was the main armament, because although they were still four triple six inch gun turrets like the town class, uh, the new guns were supposed to be dual purpose, rapid fire, or semi automatic weapons similar to those on the Worcester class cruisers and as the Americans found with the Des Moines class with their semi-automatic 8-inch guns when you introduce all the extra machinery for auto-loading um, heavy naval guns the weight of the guns and turrets goes up quite significantly so that accounted for part of the increased displacement but there were also other increases in, in armament. For example, the towns tended to carry two triple launchers. The Neptunes were designed to carry four quadruple launchers, so more than double the number of torpedoes. And in terms of anti-aircraft armament, whilst most of the towns, at least in their initial design, carried eight four-inch guns in twin mounts, um, the Neptunes would carry six twin 4.5-inch dual-purpose guns. Um, again, individually slightly heavier and more of them, although obviously later towns did carry more 4-inch guns. Uh, and there were also 20 40mm bofers in twin mounts, which exceeded the town class's proposed armament uh, for light anti-air 
by quite a significant number. So all in all, um, there was quite the increase in overall armament, which obviously necessitated a longer ship and more displacement. They were also supposed to be about a knot faster, which means at the kind of speeds you're talking about, a lot more engine power, which in turn means more engines. Um, they would have needed just under 110,000 shaft horsepower, and so that's about 30,000 more than your average town, which as I say means more engines and more boilers. And they were also designed to be able to cruise 50% further at a much higher speed so they needed a lot more fuel as well so this combination of higher speed higher endurance more fuel more and heavier armament etc um, all led to the need for a considerably larger ship which resulted in something that would have displaced about 18 and a half to 19 thousand tons deep load um, which would have been quite impressive Tamenga88 asks, What I never understood is how London treaty signatories like France and Italy got away with building 15-inch gun battleships while the limit was set at 14-inch calibre. The same could also be said with Germany's Bismarck. What kind of deal did Germany and Britain make with the Anglo-German Naval Treaty that gave Germany the ability to put bigger guns on their ship than the Royal Navy? And why did the British stick to 14-inch gun calibre despite seeing these developments taking place in European rival nations? So the answer to this is due to the particular combination of naval treaties. So you had the Washington Naval Treaty, which everyone knows about, and this actually set the limits for battleships at 35,000 tonnes apiece and actually with a maximum calibre of 16-inch guns. And treaty cruisers, obviously 10,000 tonne, 8-inch maximums. You then get the London Naval Treaty, which was 1930. That split out light and heavy cruisers, um, 6 inch and 8 inch, but still restricted 10,000 ton maximum limit. But it didn't actually change anything with regards to battleship displacement or main armament. What did change then was the second London Naval Treaty, but before that, in 1935, you had the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, where Germany signed up obviously to its supposed 35% limit compared to Britain under the previous two treaties, and remember at this point the displacement limit is 35,000 tonnes and the gun calibre is 16 inches. During this period of the early 1930s, this is also when you get the Littorio class um, built and the French start on the Dunkirks, as on the uh, Richelieu's, sorry, as a response. So that's why they both got 15-inch guns, because the treaty limits they were under at the time said they could have up to 16-inch. Um, Germany, of course, basically had no intention of actually obeying any of the naval treaties, so that one's kind of written off, but... The Second London Naval Treaty, which was agreed in 1936, right after France and Italy had started their 15-inch gunned ships, um, was the one that actually dropped the limit to 14 inches, and that's why the North Carolinas were also designed initially with 14-inch guns. It was signed by France, who basically said, yeah, after the Richelieu's we won't build anything 15-inch um, or higher. The UK, the United States, um, but... Critically, Italy didn't sign. Um, Japan obviously also didn't sign, and neither did Germany. So this was why the escalator clause was in there, because they were still trying to get Japan and Italy to agree, but the escalator clause basically said if they don't sign by early 1937, we can all go back to being 16-inch armed ships. But the UK then finished the design and ordered the King George V's in that kind of roughly a year between the signing of the second treaty, second London Naval Treaty and its expiry, and they just about ended up in a situation where the ships were too far advanced to be able to change it. Uh, the North Carolinas, a few months behind them, were able to obviously switch to triple 16s instead of their planned quad 14s. And that's why you end up with King George V as the only 14 inch gun ships. Um, if the British had wanted to play things a little bit fast and loose like the French, 
then they could have ordered them with new triple fifteens immediately before the treaty, but they thought that would jeopardise the chances of the treaty being signed. And if they hadn't ordered them immediately, sort of around the same time as the treaty was signed, they might have been delayed enough to be able to revert back to that design. But there you go. There's that's that's why. So on to the Discord questions and Apathean Themes asks in the first Gulf War. Uh, one of the Iowa class was fired on by a Soviet-manufactured anti-ship missile. The missile failed to hit the Iowa, however I was curious if you could talk a bit about what happened in the scenario and how well you think the ship would have stood up to a single hit or perhaps multiple hits uh, of the sort it potentially faced. So the incident in question occurred on February the 25th, 1991. The Iraqis had shore-based missile launchers, and one of them fired a pair of silkworm missiles at the USS Missouri, which was under escort by USS Jarrett and HMS Gloucester. The silkworm missile was a Chinese copy of the Soviet P-15 Termit missile, which was designed in the 1950s better known to the Western world by its NATO designation SSN-2 Styx. So anyway, two of these missiles were incoming. Missouri deployed chaff to try and decoy them. One of them took the bait and dived into the sea. Ostensibly, according to some reports, the uh, Phalanx CRWS system on USS Jarrett then promptly engaged the chaff cloud um, and shot the Missouri a couple of times, which was not very helpful. The other missile continued on, and there is some dispute in various sources as to whether it was heading directly for the Missouri, or whether there had been some malfunction in its seeker head, and it was still heading at the Missouri, but flying at a height such that it was likely to overfly the Missouri rather than actually impact it. But in either case, HMS Gloucester, the other escort, fired off a pair of sea dart missiles, uh, one of which successfully intercepted and destroyed the missile. Um, so that was also incidentally the first live successful engagement of a missile by another missile. Now as for how much damage it would have done, well not to put too much a point on it, but this thing was carrying a warhead that was just over half a ton of high explosive formed into a shaped charge. Now. To put that in some kind of context, the HS-293 uh, guided anti-ship missile that the Germans used in World War II had a warhead about half that, and the Fritz X uh, guided glide bomb, which was famously used to take out the Roma and do a lot of damage to the Warspite, had a warhead about three-fifths the size. And obviously... <laughs> This is uh, so. This is quite quite the explosive that would have hit the Missouri, and for all of its uh, excellent design and large size, the Missouri's armor isn't really capable of dealing with that kind of impact. It certainly wouldn't have protected it. Um, maybe maybe the turrets might have survived. I don't know. Um, I'd have to run the exact math on that. But the side armour and the deck armour, assuming the thing didn't hit at such a shallow angle that it glanced off, it wouldn't have protected it from the impact, so it would have taken a lot of damage. And the other thing you've got to remember is that, yes, there were things like two and three thousand pound armour piercing bombs in World War II, but one, <laughs> the Missouri wasn't designed to deal with those either, and two, um, those bombs carried significantly smaller explosive charges. They were usually several thousand pounds of armor-piercing steel with maybe a couple of hundred pounds of explosive in them, not over a thousand. Um, but at the same time, the Missouri is a very big ship um, and it's got very good damage control. It's very well designed to absorb impact. So Given that this is an automatically guided weapon and they tend to seek out the centre of mass of the target rather than specific ends like, say, magazines and stuff, especially on a battleship, uh, that's what the magazines aren't really in the middle, I think the Missouri could have quite reasonably have survived an impact from a single silkworm missile. Um, about the nightmare scenario would be either if it gets its... Uh, 
course calculations wrong and ends up hitting as a, in the vicinity of the magazines because that could go very badly for obvious reasons um, but more likely if its seeker had actually worked properly and it had smashed itself into the ship amidships your main hazard would have been massive flooding of the engine spaces um, which obviously could have posed a serious threat to the ship but at the same time it could have just smashed into the superstructure at which point it would have done a lot of superficial damage probably killed a lot of people set some fires but the ship's watertight integrity wouldn't have been compromised and of course the Missouri did have its own phalanx CW, CIWS systems so there is a small chance they would have taken the, sh the missile down at the last minute um, so to answer the final aspect of the question which was multiple hits um if you're talking about multiple hits, like 3 plus, assuming that these are all actual hits, I wouldn't fancy the Missouri's chances that much. I mean, apart from anything, as the Falklands show, there's a lot of burning rocket fuel. And it's, I mean, it's a very big ship. It can absorb a lot of damage, but over a ton and a half of high explosive shaped charge, plus rocket fuel, etc., that's going to be pushing it even for the Missouri. But I think a single hit, yeah, it would have taken damage. The amount of damage... Yeah, there's, there's a sort of roll your D100. If you luck out and get a natural zero, you might actually just see the whole thing disappear in a catastrophic explosion as the charge punches through into the magazine. But most likely, it would have been damaged. It would have had to haul out of line and head for repairs. But I think the Missouri could have survived. Life Beyond Living asks how to fight between a Kronstadt class and a refitted Scharnhorst with 15 inch guns. Go! So this is the actual uh, Kronstadt, nearly 40,000 tons with three twin 15-inch guns, as opposed to the uh, slightly bizarre World of Warships version, which carries um, three triple 305 millimeters. Ironically enough, um, the armaments of the two ships are identical. Um, they're both planning on using the twin 15-inch German guns designed for the Bismarck class, so... Um, yeah, main gun wise, absolutely equal. Um, speed wise, there's not a lot in it. Displacement wise, Kronstadt displaces massively more than Scharnhorst at um, nearly 40,000 tonne standard load. But it only has a 9.1 inch belt as opposed to Scharnhorst's much heavier belt. So you can probably see where this is going. Scharnhorst almost by definition is going to be the better protected of the two. They have exactly the same main armament. Scharnhorst's armor is thicker, therefore Scharnhorst will be able to engage in a range bracket where it can hurt Kronstadt and Kronstadt cannot hurt it, although it's going to be a fairly long range gunfight if it wants to go with that. Um, once it starts landing, obviously Scharnhorst being the smaller ship is not going to be able to absorb as many of them, whereas Kronstadt at 40,000 tons can probably take a few. Um, although with that thin belt armor, um, it's probably going to take some fairly deep penetrating damaging hits. So overall, especially given the quality of crew, relative quality of crews that are likely to be involved, I'm probably going to hand this to the refitted Scharnhorst purely because it's going to be able to survive a few more hits um, early on because of its superior, superior armor and... Um, yeah. Admiral Scheer asks, uh, say in 1914 with the outbreak of the war, the Royal Navy decides to create a new set of battleships to one-up even the Queen Elizabeth and Revenge classes. In line with their existing iterative approach, what would you say is the most likely armament, size, caliber, layout, and armor belt of this hypothetical HMS escalation? Well, as I've mentioned earlier, the Queen Elizabeths um, were kind of a uh, derivative Initially, the design was sort of enlarged Iron Duke with 10 15 inch guns and the same 21 to 23 knot top speed, and they instead went for one less gun turret and higher speed. The Revenge class reverted back to that lower speed and simplified the main armor layout, um, arguably possibly making it better. So, if they're going to iterate on that, they're not going to go full battlecruiser hood style. Um, because that was a battle cruiser, and they're iterating on a battleship. So I think they're probably going to go with something like maybe 23 to 24 knots top speed. They'll probably be attracted to that as uh, 
at this point, Fisher and or his influence is still prevalent, so they are probably going to push for the slightly higher speed. Armour, I suspect, would again probably be an iterative step up. Iron Duke, obviously, and then Queen Elizabeth and Revenge were iterative steps. So you probably end up something with like the simplified Revenge class layout, maybe with 14 to 14 and a half inch thick armour. Size, calibre and layout of guns, I suspect they're probably then going to sort of revisit that first Queen Elizabeth concept. So you'll end up with something like uh, probably te uh, Iron Duke style layout so Q turret comes back so 10 15 inch guns 23 24 knot top speed uh, 14 14 and a half inch uh, armor in revenge type layout and uh, yeah I think that would be their next generation of battleship I don't think they would have jumped up to 16 inch so quickly and without that um, adding an extra turret seems to be the most logical step for them Newmany asks, what are your thoughts regarding the usage and tactics employed by Q ships in the First World War? Were they effective um, in what they did? So the Q ship was basically uh, kind of a, a variation on the theme of an armed merchant raider, except it wasn't going raiding, it waited for the U-boat to come to it. Uh, now you might think that is suicidal, but in the First World War, U-boats carried a very limited stock of torpedoes, and so given that merchant ships were supposed to be unprotected, they would prefer to surface, challenge the ship, and then sink it with its deck guns, uh, as this was a much more efficient way of, uh, of carrying out their mission. And certainly in the first part of the war, they were still being held to commerce raider rules, which required them to challenge and sometimes even inspect ships, give them a chance to get their crew off, etc. Very unlike what we normally think of as U-boat warfare. So the idea was, pretend to be a helpless merchant ship, U-boat surfaces, down come the disguise, oh look, it's covered in guns, shoot the U-boat, U-boat dies. Um, this was somewhat effective. Um, it made the, you can argue it both ways, it made the U-boats a lot more wary of surfacing to attack what they thought were helpless merchant ships, and this did limit the U-boats' utility to a certain degree because it meant they were forced to expend torpedoes, which then limited their uh, the number of ships that they could kill a lot more than just the, than the use of deck guns and torpedoes combined. On the other hand, it did mean that ships were now more likely to just be torpedoed out of hand without warning, which did lead to more casualties. So you can argue it overall either way, and obviously once the U-boat started torpedoing ships without warning, then the utility of Q-ships disappeared entirely because the U-boat was never going to tell you it was there. I guess in the final judgment as to whether or not you rate them as effective... I'd have to say it's basically it's a personal judgment do you value ships or people more if you value ships and getting uh, goods and equipment through to the UK which of the pragmatic sort of logical approach then yes Q ships were effective because it meant that more ships could get through because the U-boats physically couldn't kill as many ships um if you value the crews themselves more, then they probably could be argued to have done slightly more harm than good in as much as a lot more um, merchant seamen would then be end up being chucked into the sea or randomly blown up by incoming torpedoes without warning. And Lemon Gem 3021668 asks a question that a few other people have asked, which is why don't you have three turret super firing instead of two? Now, I think we have covered this in some other questions, so just to briefly recap, it basically comes down to the fact that you put a third turret super firing, your barbette is a lot taller, which adds more weight, and also that big heavy gun turret is now much higher above your ship, which gives you stability problems, um, which is why you don't see uh, three, gun, three turret super firing outside of ships with relatively light turrets like the Dido and Atlanta classes, and in the end both of those ships were quite notorious for having stability problems. And finally for this week, Luchs asks, what would be some of the ramifications of a successful Operation Tengo? So Operation Tengo called for the Yamato, one light cruiser and eight destroyers to try and fight their way through the US 5th Fleet to land at Okinawa. And when I say land, I mean, yes, that is literally 
drive their ships ashore because they realised that trying to face the entire Fifth Fleet um, would very rapidly lead to their sinking. So the cunning plan was, well, if we're beached, you can't physically sink a ship that has nowhere to go in the downwards direction. So, yes, this was basically a gigantic 70,000 ton plus kamikaze mission. Now, historically, the American ships were fairly quickly spotted and then sunk by massive air assault from the US Navy's carrier aircraft. So, to work out how we get to a successfully executed Tango, we have to try and consider how it was successful. The most obvious thing seems to be to me to change the weather. If they if the weather is quite rough, quite misty, foggy, rainy, etc., limits visibility and the ab ability of air reconnaissance aircraft to fly, then that could delay or avoid the Japanese ships being detected, so they would get a lot closer to their destination. Now, if this weather continues to ramp up into a somewhat unseasonable minor typhoon or something like that, this also restricts the aircraft carrier's ability to launch aircraft, so even if the Japanese forces eventually spotted, there's precious little they can really do about it. So, having removed the uh, US Navy's ability to erase the ship from existence by mass air assault, then that leaves us with a slightly more thorny issue to get around to make this operation successful, which is that as backup, you have six battleships and seven cruisers waiting for them, including in the cruiser section, the Alaska and the Guam, um, and the battleships themselves, Massachusetts, Indiana, New Jersey, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Missouri. So you have three of the Iowa class, um... <laughs> Yeah, and uh, three of the South Dakota class, plus um, there's a bunch of uh, lesser battleships in the area as well. Quite how the Yamato is supposed to get its way past that lot, I'm not entirely sure. The only way that I can think that this is going to successfully get pulled off is if in the middle of all this uh, storm and everything... The Japanese just flat out aren't spotted until they're practically on top of Okinawa. And maybe in the rough seas and everything, they come from one side. And the American fleet is mostly deployed on the other side. And there just isn't the time to reposition the American ships in time to intercept the, the Japanese force at sea. And maybe if they get there, the, the destroyers effectively kamikaze themselves to keep them occupied. Long enough, at least, for Yamato to put itself aground at the island. Or islands. But even assuming through some miracle of weather, luck and happenstance, the Yamato manages to fetch itself up on Okinawa... Yeah, it's going to destroy a few ship, a few small ships and transports, but the simple fact of the matter is it's just horribly outgunned. Um, now, that, that six battleship and several heavy cruiser line sounded bad enough, but let's add up the total number of ships that would very rapidly bring themselves to bear, just counting the big guns. So you have three of the four Iowa class, Wisconsin, Missouri, New Jersey and they have the Alaska and Guam with them. Then you have both North Carolinas, the North Carolina and Washington, plus the South Dakota in the next battleship division. Then you have the other two South Dakotas, Massachusetts and Indiana, in battleship division eight. So at this point you're already up to every single modern US battleship that the US Navy possesses with the exception of Iowa and Alabama. You also have HMS King George V and HMS Howe from the British Pacific Fleet. And then you have Task Force 54, so you have USS New Mexico, USS New York, USS Idaho, USS West Virginia, USS Tennessee, USS Nevada, USS Colorado, USS Maryland, believe it or not, USS Arkansas, and of course, USS Texas. So yeah, basically, as has been said before, almost every single battleship the United States Navy physically possesses, plus a couple of British ones thrown in for good measure. A successfully beached Yamato is swiftly going to win the award for most shelled piece of real estate in global history. And it really doesn't matter how well the Yamato is protected at this point. 
even if ev somehow by hand of the japanese gods every single shell fired at it is a dud it's going to be destroyed through erosion um apart from anything else just yeah it's just going to be ablated away by the sheer weight of shells there'll just be a a, a big pile of explosives and steel left where Yamato used to be um there is no way this ends well for it um the sole ramification will probably be we desperately need aircraft um equipped with radar that can fly in bad weather um then I think on that rather amusing note uh it's time to wrap up this week's episode